Hello and welcome to the Wellness Plus podcast. I'm your host, Karina Rachel, and I'm joined today by Karen Shopoff Roof. She's a personal trainer, a certified holistic health coach, and founder of runningforbalance.com. Karen, thank you so much for being here with me today. Thank you for having me. So in your health coaching and fitness training programs, you have this really big emphasis on balance. And I think that is so poignant, whether we're talking about physical balance, Mm -hmm, (laughs) actually being able to physically balance and feel really sure-footed, but then also in our lives, how we balance our work, our workouts, and reducing stress, which all of us have heard a million times, we have to reduce our stress. But I know as a health coach, I see people feeling overwhelmed just by the idea of reducing their stress. (laughs) Absolutely. I'm so excited that you get my pun because I have been balance personal fitness training for more than 10 years and the blog running on balance for almost 10 years. And that is exactly it. That it's not, it's about the physical part that Mm -hmm. I want you to be sure-footed and strong and be able to get through your everyday activities. You know, I call it like running the everyday Olympics. Yes. (laughs) But I also really truly believe that you have to be balanced balanced in your physical body, but as well as how do you spend your time? How do you spend your energy and how do you spend your gifts so that you're really living the life that you want? Right. And how do we actually integrate all of those things that we know we quote unquote should do or we want to do and just make that a reality? Yes. Um, So you had talked about, you know, the concept of simple switches and ways to start integrating healthier habits into our lifestyle. Um, What would you say is maybe one of the most common of those little switches that you end up recommending with clients? Over and over again, when I meet with clients, I hear from them that they've been sold the fitness industry sort of myth that I have to go to the gym for an hour or the workout doesn't count. Mm. And I sort of pull back and I say, you know what? That's not what the science says. The science says we can do shorter, smaller workouts. We can accumulate minutes over the course of a day and Mm. still reap the physiological, the internal health benefits of exercise so that you don't feel like you're playing Google Calendar Jenga every day (laughs) to like fit that block in and make it work. So instead, you know, probably the most practical tip that I give people is to just start being aware of when they're picking up their cell phone and they're Mm. doing the scrolly, 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 scrolly because they feel like they don't really have enough time to do anything. You know, they can't make that phone call that they need to make because maybe it's going to go 5, 10, 15 minutes. They don't really have time to swing through the grocery store to pick up dinner, but they got enough time to do the scrolly, scrolly for a few minutes. (laughs) So instead, can you stop the scrolly, scrolly and figure out how can I move right now? Mm. So that maybe it's not, you're not, you know, busting out burpees. I mean, go for it if you want to, but you don't have to. You know, maybe for me, it's often I get to a kid's soccer practice. The coach hasn't let him out yet. I have no idea whether it's going to be one minute or five minutes. So I just get out of my car and step up and down on the curb. Nice. Really, really simple. Mm-hmm. But it's about finding those like dead minutes in your day. Yeah. And turning them into whatever kind of active time appeals to you. I love that because you're so right. It feels uh, it feels challenging to set off a huge block of time, right. you know, to find an hour for the gym and 30 minutes before and an hour afterwards. I mean, it can feel really overwhelming. Um, but I love that idea of finding the little minutes where, yeah, we're scrolling through social media or just doing whatever. There's so many times throughout the day that we just have a couple minutes of downtime. So mm-hmm. why not use it rather than just spending it doing something that doesn't contribute to your health and actually helping you reach all of those different, you know, health and weight loss goals you might have. Right. And I find the feedback I get from my clients a lot is that once they start inserting that activity all throughout their day, then suddenly it becomes easier to schedule the bigger blocks of time because they've gotten the benefit of more movement. They've gotten Mm. more energy. They've gotten, you know, reduced brain fog. So they're more productive. So all of a sudden they can get all their stuff done. And then, oh my gosh, here bubbles up an entire 30 minutes at one time. Mm -hmm. And so then you make a change and it can just build from there. 
I'm definitely a, a big fan of offering those um, little simple changes. And you're so right that taking advantage of those little pieces of time so that we can start reaping the benefits of taking mm -hmm. on those healthy habits. And then suddenly that becomes the impetus for you to say, wow, if I feel this good just doing exactly. a couple minutes here and a couple minutes there, what if I actually yeah. did, you know, 10 or 20 or 30 minute workout? Yep. Um, and there's so many things that you can do at home or like you said, at the park or you know, um, doing things that are active, that going to the gym in itself is just one out of maybe right. like hundreds of different hundreds. ways that you could be active. So, hundreds. Um, and I think that if people sort of stop and think about, you know, do I even like going to the gym? Because that's sort of the next roadblock that I hear from people is like, oh, well, I don't ever go because I don't like it. Mm. And then I sort of reflect back and I'm like, well, what do you like? Like, did you play a sport as a kid? Have you always wanted to try stand-up paddleboarding because you see those people out on the lake and it looks like fun? Mm -hmm. Or, you know, maybe you have um, an inner fencer who, you know, got inspired watching the Olympics. I mean, it doesn't really matter what it is. But right. if you find whatever it is that you like, you're going to make the time for it. Mm -hmm. You're going to make it more of a priority. So if that's where your stumbling block is as well, you know, I don't go to the gym because I hate going to the gym, then stop going to the gym. <laughs> or, you know, find a friend who can take you to a class at the gym that's more in line with what you want to do. But, mm -hmm. you know, don't feel limited that just because you've always done something. I mean, the same thing is true, you know, if you've always gone to the same class and, you know, suddenly you find yourself sort of griping and gritching about going to the class or that you don't like the music that a new instructor plays or whatever it is, change. Mm. Like, you don't have to stay in your same pattern. Right. So in addition to that, you know, fitness piece, because I know that everyone – you know, most people, they have a weight loss goal or they have an intention that they want to work out more. Um, but can we kind of flip back over to the other piece of that, which is stress? Hmm. You know, as much as we hear, you need to work out, you need to be active, you have to work your body, we're also being told now you have to reduce your stress. Right. And for me, for so many years, that just felt like a big giant question mark. Right. Like, or okay, it well, feels I've... like one more thing you're failing at. Yeah. <laughs> or one more thing that's stressing you out. Yes. Yes. <laughs> so what yeah. would be the recommendations for how do we actually reduce our stress without making ourselves feel more stressed out in the process? Right. Well, I think it, you know, in the same way, it's the same kind of thought process what I was just talking about regarding really making sure that whatever type of activity you're doing resonates with you and that mm. you're motivated to do it and you want to keep doing it. Taking a look at the other things that you have going on in your life and, you know, just I like to, to brain dump them out on a piece of paper. Like, what are all of my responsibilities? What are all of my more or less regular activities? And really take a hard look at it and be like, you know what? I just really don't like going to book club anymore. Like, it's not I never I'm never reading the book, so I can't participate in the conversation um, you know, it's just, it's not feeding me. Mm. So really stress reduction comes from taking a look at all of the different things you have going on in your life and giving it a good hard assessment over what's filling you versus what's depleting you. Mm. And if you have things on your list that are depleting you and they're choices that you're making to continue to do them, what happens if you stop doing them? Right. In so many cases, the answer is nothing really. Mm -hmm. I just suddenly shed that weight. Right. So. And I think that kind of speaks to there's, you know, there's a lot of external pressures oh, yeah. on us as well. So yeah. we have a lot of pressures that we put on ourselves. But then we also have, you know, like for parents, for instance, I know there's always kind of that pressure that you should be more engaged at school or go on the field trips and do these different things. And I know a lot of parents who end up, you know, kind of, at the sacrifice of their own health, yes. <laughs> you know, kind of taking on so many of those different uh, kind of extra things that in the end, it's like, yes, you want to be there and, you know, yes, they're good things. But at the same time, if it's taking you um, into an area of being more stressed and you're not sleeping as much, then now, you know, it is affecting right. your family life, your daily life, your health, your, yeah, your, you know, and 
everything that uh, kind of has a domino effect. Right. You know, so your health starts going, it affects your personal relationships, your work relationships. Um, and then to take that example of parents, again, you know, there's always that balance. Yeah. <laughs> Coming back to that concept um, that, you know, yeah, we have to stay aware of what we're doing. And I know for myself that when I start feeling that just anxious, too mm -hmm. much, too much overwhelm, um, that if I do, like you said, kind of an inventory of all the things I'm trying to do, I end up realizing that, yeah, you know, I'm spreading myself so, so thin, thin across all these things yeah. that, of course, I'm feeling really stressed. And then I realize I'm not really showing up as well to all those different things And that, I'm that's doing. exactly it, is that if you are, you're only one person, and that one of the greatest gifts you can give yourself is to honor your human bandwidth mm -hmm. and say, I am only <laughs> one person. Right. And no, I can't do that because I don't have the time. I don't have the energy. I don't have the heart space. I don't have the skill set, whatever it is. But to be okay with the fact that you can't do everything. Mm -hmm. And I want to go back to your example of talking about parents wanting to show up for things all the time because um, I work with a lot of moms and I work with a lot of moms in the sandwich generation. So they're raising teenagers at the same time they're caring for aging parents. Wow. And so they're really feeling the squeeze. And one of the things that I have found over and over again, women, women in particular, saying when they're writing out their list of how, you know, how they're spending their time, I'm finding that very few kids now ride the school bus, that their parents, if, even if the school bus is offered, you know, as the service from the district or whatever, mm -hmm. parents are driving them to school because... They feel like they don't want their child on the bus for 30 minutes. Mm -hmm. And then when I ask them, well, how long does it take you to take your kid to school? They're like, oh, 30, 35 minutes. And I want to go back and I, and I say, you know, very lovingly, but why is their 30 minutes worth more than your 30 minutes? Mm. Because the school bus is a safe and convenient way for them to get to school. Right. And suddenly you're creating more work for yourself when you don't really need to. Mm -hmm. And almost without exception, that's a pretty big aha moment yeah. for women because they think they're doing the right thing, right? right? They think they're doing the loving thing by making the path easy for their child, which they are, but at the expense of themselves. Mm -hmm. And that's a, like, wow, wait a minute. If I could have 30 minutes every day back... That's a huge amount of time. Right. Maybe that's when I journal. Maybe that's when I meal prep dinner in the morning. Maybe that's when I do my yoga. Maybe it's when I just sit there and read a book and drink a cup of coffee. Mm -hmm. It doesn't matter what it is, but it can become reclaimed time for you. Right. And, you know, getting back to that idea of balance, which is just such a, a huge concept, you know, I think a lot of times we're juggling, like, those things that everyone else wants of us and those things that we would like to do mm -hmm. or that we know that we should do for yeah, ourselves, should. like Ugh. taking the time to do something we enjoy mm -hmm. or taking the time to go get a massage or go mm -hmm. do something fun or, you know, just get out of the uh, kind of, you know, hamster wheel, so to speak, for a little while and just relax. And there's, I would just imagine that there's, you know, kind of this um, I don't know, at least for me, it's like a constant swinging back and forth mm -hmm. of like, I want to say yes to all of the things for everyone right. else. Yeah. But then the things that I'm like, well, I should really just go to bed earlier. I should really do this thing or that thing. And then I won't say yes to the things that are for me. Right. So it's like yes. you're... You and spend I, your energy on everybody else and then there's no time and energy left. Yeah. For yourself. Super common. And and that's a big topic on this podcast, you know, in the kind of realm of self-care mm -hmm. is is getting into the habit of saying yes to yourself. Yes. And knowing that when you do those things for yourself, even though, you know, our our kind of judgmental part of ourselves says like, oh, that's selfish or why would I do that selfish thing? But actually when we do care for ourselves, it's it's improving all of those other aspects and yeah. positively impacting the people in our lives, sure, too. Sure, sure. I like to think, too, I, I was born without a selfish gene. I'm not really super proud of it, but I'm, I'm trying to be more proud of it because it's made 
self-care for me, I think, easier than for a lot of people because I don't feel guilt mm. around taking care of myself. In fact, when I think of the phrase like work-life balance, I'm totally the opposite. I want life-work balance, right? <laughs> for me, life is first, and then my work grows out of my life. But, you know, when I'm sitting down at the beginning of each week and I'm looking at the calendar and I'm trying to figure out you know, personally for me, my huge self-care component comes from um, I'm a distance runner and I love it and it's part of my identity and it feeds me and it nurtures me and it gives me open brain space and creative time and all sorts of things well beyond anything physical in terms of, you know, just health benefits. Mm -hmm. So that's what I schedule first each week is I go in and I block off that time and sometimes that means that, you know, I'm running to the soccer field to watch my kids game. So I'm the parent who shows up completely sweaty and gross <laughs> and stinky. But then I get there and people are like, wow, that was really smart. I should totally do that. <laughs> like, yeah, I, I probably could have done that too. And so I think it, it, in some ways it takes being willing to step outside of the box and to release care of what other people think mm -hmm. about you in order to really embrace yourself and what you right. want to do and how it feeds you. Mm -hmm. And kind of making yourself a priority the Absolutely. same way that we, we prioritize so many other things Everybody in our else. lives. Um, but largely, if we're not prioritizing ourselves, then we're not going to have the energy, the patience, oh, <laughs> you know, yeah. all of these things that yeah. end up making the rest of our lives flow really smoothly. Yeah. And, uh, and I think a lot of people, too, because they're giving and giving and giving and giving all the time, wind up really resenting the people to whom they're giving all the time. Mm. And those are usually the people who they love the most. Right. And so then they're caught in the, that sort of tangle of emotions of, I really love you, but I really don't want to be doing this right now. Mm -hmm. um, you know, certainly there's an element of that. That's a reality. Right. You know? But um yeah, how can we more thoughtfully approach the things that we do to really take care of ourselves mm -hmm. all the time? What are some other uh, examples of the simple switches that you find yourself recommending for people? Um, well, I, in terms of diet, let's go there because that's, you know, an area that most people, you know, it's, it's very confusing, right? Mm -hmm. If you've ever walked down the aisles of the grocery store and you, like, look at the packaging, it's like, I got no idea what's inside there because there's all these buzzwords on the mm -hmm. boxes and they all contradict themselves and I have no idea what's happening. And, you know, I figure I actually, like, do this for a living and so how confused must other people be? Right. So <laughs> I love simple switches uh, for, for diet. And the one that I normally recommend um, – and I will preempt spoiler alert right here. I don't ever make anybody give up their coffee because that's just not a fight worth taking on. <laughs> um, I always try to suggest crowding out bad habits with, with good habits. Mm -hmm. So instead of saying, you can't ever drink morning coffee again, you know, and then people are like, yeah, right, lady, I'm not doing that. Uh, we're, we're done here. Um, why don't we start with, you know, can you get yourself into the habit of putting a water bottle or a glass of water next to your bed at night so that when you wake up in the morning, as you are getting out of bed slowly and with deep breaths, rather than just launching out of your bed when your alarm goes off, mm -hmm. that you actually drink a glass of water before your feet even hit the floor. Mm. Hydration is responsible for over 400 systems within our body. Wow. And most of us are chronically dehydrated. We're talking about everything from like basic cell function to your immune system function. Mm -hmm. So if you can start your day by nourishing your body with a simple glass of water, you've already started off on the right foot. Right. So drink the water and drink the coffee. You can also look at things, you know, a lot of people, I want to give up sugar. To which I say, you rock on, honey, because I'm not giving up sugar forever and ever. That's just not within my realm of capability. Mm -hmm. So instead, I'm going to think about I can have one treat each day with sugar, 78% dark chocolate if anybody really cares and wants to find my address and send me some. <laughs> um, but I can have that 
after I've had at least nine servings of fruits and vegetables throughout the day. Wow. Because if I've had my nine servings of fruits and vegetables, I have my fiber. I have my rainbow of nutrients mm -hmm. that, and vitamins that are coming from all of that. Um, and I'm going to be pretty full. So the likelihood that I'm going to overindulge on a sugary treat at that point right. is very, very small. So again, how can we, a simple switch of crowding out the bad mm -hmm. habits, replacing them with something good instead. Right. And I think for so many people, just that first step of really taking a realistic look at how much sugar is is in all of these different foods we're consuming. Everything. And everyone is on a different spectrum, you know, but even among those quote unquote healthy foods, a lot of them contain a, a pretty shocking amount of sugar. Yeah, salad dressing. Yeah. You know, everything from, yeah, salad dressing, pasta sauce, mm -hmm. um, and even those things like, you know, ketchup. Oh, yeah. Filled with high fructose corn syrup. If you're having, you Peanut know. Peanut butter. Yeah. There's just all these kind of hidden mm -hmm. sources of sugar. So, you know, that was a big piece for me because I used to feel like, oh, I don't eat that much sugar. I'm really good. I don't eat candy bars. I, right. I gave up sodas many years ago. Um, and then I uh, actually did one of those like mail-in blood tests. Yeah. And my, my blood sugar wasn't super high, but it was a little high. And at that point I was like, well, maybe I should kind of do a little assessment. Mm -hmm. um, and so I just kind of started like glancing at the sugar amounts on different things. And um, I have this little thing I've done in a lot of my nutrition videos where I kind of show like how many sugar packets mm -hmm. that would represent. Right. So if there's about four grams of sugar in a sugar packet, then if you've got something with 40 grams of sugar, that's 10 sugar packets. Right. And would you actually eat 10 sugar packets? Yeah. And so you know, I actually did a video where I was like looking at different Starbucks drinks mm -hmm. and sodas. Ugh. And it was like 16 sugar right. packets, right. 12 sugar packets. Makes and your I teeth thought, itch. Yeah. I thought, you know, whoever adds 10 or 12 sugar packets to their tea at dinner or something yeah. like that. Um, so I kind of started doing that and, and trying to pay attention and really think about it in a, in a tangible way. Cause yeah. if you're just thinking like 30 grams, 40 grams, this, it yeah. gets a little overwhelming. And it's just numbers and it um, doesn't make sense. But yeah. And I started noticing like, all right, so this, you know, drink that I like to get 25 grams of sugar, this other thing. And then if you're eating breads, pasta, yeah. all of those it kind of up. hidden sugars that aren't even sweet, they're like mm -hmm. deceptive sugars. Um, and I started realizing that I was consuming way more sugar than I even realized. Mm -hmm. So for me, the next step from there was like, all right, well, can I just start replacing some of these processed sugars and high fructose corn syrup type of things with just a, a healthier sugar right? or coconut sugar, something that at least is going to give you a little bit of health benefits yeah. in there too. Yeah. There's something else in the nutrient profile other right. than just the sugar. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I think that it's so important because there's so many people who, again, like if you were to tell them, you know, okay, well, you can't eat sugar anymore. That's just such a mind blowingly impossible concept mm -hmm. that there's no effort made at all. They're like, nope, can't do it. I'm out. Right. Um, yeah. So trying to find ways to, as you say, reduce and make substitutes. But I think it really does all come down to being aware mm -hmm. of what you're eating and that, you know, these things add up. And I don't know if you've, if you've found the same, but I think that our, our educational system in the U.S. Uh, does a really poor job teaching basic nutrition. Oh, definitely. And that I work with very, very well-educated, I mean, doctoral level people. Mm -hmm who do not understand the difference between a carbohydrate and a protein, much less what does that do to their blood sugar mm -hmm. when they eat either a carbohydrate or a protein. And you have to think, like, that's pretty amazing. Yeah. Because they can talk about, you know, sending rockets to Mars, but they don't understand really basic health profiles, what is happening in their bodies. Mm -hmm. And, you know, that's certainly not, a, that is not all a slam on these individual people. Instead, I think it's a real failure of our educational system that we're not giving people the tools that they need mm -hmm. in order to make these basic decisions that if they, if they were better informed, they right. could make better decisions, the overall health would be better, 
and as a public health issue, mm -hmm. I think we, we could rise significantly. I definitely, I definitely agree with you in, in that area. Um, and it's a shame that um, so many of the kind of food giants, so to speak, are producing things that, in my opinion, are poison. Yep. They're poisons that are marketed to people yeah. disguised as healthy foods, like yeah. the wolf in sheep's clothing yeah. or whatever. Um, and then billions and billions of dollars that go into marketing these things yeah. for us. So I fully... Um, feel that the the plight to eat healthy, you know, the deck is kind of stacked against us. Absolutely. You know, and once you do kind of understand, like for me, I just kind of pare it down to super basics, like avoiding processed foods. Yes. Just taking that one piece of the sugar aspect. Yes. If you start, you know, trying to avoid the processed foods, avoid the things that say low fat or fat free. Right. Because they're always going to have something else in there. They're going to have a lot of extra sugar, yep. and then similarly, the things that are sugar-free are going to tend to have way more fat. Right. But if you just avoid the processed foods right. altogether, suddenly it can start, you know, just feeling much easier exactly. to kind of control what we're eating. Um, but I also recognize that those processed foods are the foods that are affordable. They're everywhere. They're being advertised to us maybe like every five feet down the right. highway we're driving. Yeah. Um, so it's it's not an easy thing to start just, no. you know, oh, I'm just going to stop eating all of these no, foods. No, it's not. <laughs> and I think, too, that there's some, um, there's some stigma and some shame that gets attached to it to the point where people find it very difficult to say, I want to change the way I'm eating. Because in order to get to that point, there's some admission that, they haven't been operating in the healthiest way possible. Mm. And I think that that's where, you know, having resources where people can find good quality information without shame and judgment attached is a really, really important part of what health coaching should be. Right. Right. And helping people to just uh, kind of make sense of all of the different things that are out there and then find the things that they truly love to eat. Yes. You know, um, that's one of the biggest things that I feel I want to kind of dispel is that eating healthy has to mean that you're deprived, you're right. never enjoying things, you look at other people eating what they want to eat, and it's like, oh my gosh, if only that could be me. Right. Like, no, it's actually the complete opposite. Yeah. Once you start eating these healthy foods, you're going to find that there's all of these delicious things you maybe didn't even know existed. And, you know, once you start eating those foods, same as you kind of said earlier, once you start integrating a couple minutes of exercise mm -hmm. here and there, as you start integrating those healthier foods and you feel your body go, <gasps> yeah, you crave that feeling and it <laughs> yeah. makes it easier to make better choices. Mm -hmm. And then suddenly it becomes a much, uh, a much simpler thing to eat healthy. It's not... Um, it's not something we dread. Right. You know? Yeah. I have a saying that I like to use with my clients that sad makes me happy because sad means either salad a day or smoothie a day. <laughs> and so if I make sure that every day I have either a salad as a meal or a smoothie, usually as my breakfast, which I will say back, lots of protein in that smoothie, not just the straight carbs because mm -hmm. I don't want the sugar crash later. That that I crave the feeling of fullness, the feeling mm -hmm. of satisfaction, the feeling of, like, feeding my engine what it wants. Yeah. And when you get that feeling and you have the stable energy that those types of foods can give you, then it's not... It's not a burden to eat a salad every day for lunch. I right. love salads. And if you think, like, I'm talking, like, you know lettuce and a couple carrots and a sad slice of tomato on it, then like we need to up your salad game yeah. uh, because as you're saying, there's like tons of amazing combinations that are mm -hmm. all delicious, but you know, it's just packing something with nutrition that truly feeds you. Right. And I, I'm the same way, you know, I love salads, but again, it's not about like, wow, yes, I love lettuce. Although yeah. I, I kind of do love lettuce yeah. now, you know, um, but it's about all the things you put in it, you right. know, walnuts or pecans or dried cranberries, strawberries, grapes. I'm actually yeah. going to publish a video um, 
a little bit later today with one of my favorite kind of salad recipes. Um, but yeah, empowering people to um, get really creative, Yes, you know, with different foods and, you know, because that's another thing, you know, they might feel like, oh, healthy me- eating means I have to eat, you know, brown rice and broccoli and chicken. Right. Well, it's yeah. like, well, that's like one example of maybe thousands of different things you could eat. So if you don't like brown rice or chicken or broccoli, right. eat something else, then it's totally fine. You can still eat healthy. Mm-hmm. Um, I loved what you said uh, as you were talking there about um, something about like energetically stable. (laughs) Yeah. Um, One of the other things I noticed as I kind of just started to transition to eating more natural foods, staying away from those highly processed foods, is that, yes, you can get that feeling of satisfaction and feeling full where you're like, wow, I actually feel like I couldn't eat anything yeah. else right now. But not in a gross kind of way. Yeah, but not in different. the like, oh, food coma. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Now I'm going to be like... Yeah, on the couch for two hours. Yeah, unable to do anything else mm-hmm. or whatever. And so I think that's a big piece too, that once you start to adapt some of these little changes, um, maybe, you know, I always kind of tell people like, maybe you start out with a goal of like one salad a week. Mm-hmm. Or if that feels scary one salad a month. Yeah. But as you start kind of integrating these things and keep coming back to them, um, finding those new flavors or dressings or smoothie recipes that you crave and you get really excited about, um, and you start to kind of experience how good it feels eating that way, mm-hmm. suddenly it becomes easier to make yeah. those choices. And it I does. think largely just getting out of our habits yes. is maybe the ch- most challenging part. It is. And, and a lot of times people's eating habits have been ingrained since childhood. Mm. It's not even things that decisions that they're consciously making as adults. It's just the way that they've always done it and it's what they know. Mm -hmm. And so again, there's that piece of like, you know, don't feel ashamed that you didn't know differently. You just didn't know differently. Great. You've recognized it. Let me support you and help you move on. Mm -hmm. Um, Because I, I think that one of the really big Uh, public health issues that we have, particularly in the U.S., is um, not not about obesity, but it's really about blood sugar and diabetes Mm. and metabolic types of diseases. And many of those are rooted in ignorance. And they're rooted in that fact that people don't really understand how foods work in their body. Mm -hmm. And so instead of having constant energy levels throughout the day that support all the millions of cool functions that your body does, they're like riding on this hormonal roller coaster up and down all day long. And so Mm -hmm. if you feel like, you know, you're like trotting along on the horse and then all of a sudden it gets pulled way back and you can't do anything. And then, you know, you start trotting again and then you get pulled back and you can't do anything. If that's like what your day feels like, you know, Drill down on what's happening with your nutrition. Are you eating in such a way that's actually creating those peaks and valleys, that Mm -hmm. fast and slow kind of feeling? Um, Because in many cases, it it really is as simple as dietary changes, small dietary changes. But, you know, can you imagine how much better you feel when you get off of that crazy roller coaster? Mm -hmm. And I think that for so many of us that have just been on that roller coaster for maybe our whole lives, yeah. um, it's hard to even imagine what it's Impo- like yeah. to it is just so hard. have consistent energy throughout the day Right. to not, you know, feel like uh, your body suddenly weighs a million pounds at two in the afternoon right. and, and you, you can't ha- even hold your head up. Right. And, or that you're like the person walking around the office who's like, okay, who's going to Starbucks today? Like, <laughs> like I got to, I, I got to have caffeine or I'm just not going to make it. Mm-hmm. You know, what's, what's happening with the input of your nutrition that's causing that energy output? Yeah. You know, blood sugar is such It's such a hot topic, and it's one of those things that um, I'm glad that you mentioned it in kind of relationship to energy levels, because I think for so many people, they kind of think like, oh, blood sugar. Oh, well, I'm not pre-diabetes, or I have never, I don't have diabetes in my family, or something like that, and it feels like, oh, it's not an issue. Right. When realistically... Blood sugar, I mean, is up there with your oxygen and your water in terms of life and death for your body. So I think it's really 
important for people to understand how much that blood sugar level and your body's ability to regulate it um, is going to have this huge influence on the rest of your life. Your mood, your Absolutely. patience and irritability, your energy levels, and those slumps in energy or not that might come. Um, and then also we had another um, another uh, functional medicine practitioner um, and we were doing a course on anxiety. Mm -hmm. And I said, you know, what are the biggest causes of anxiety? And he said, blood sugar and oxygen. Yep. And I was kind of surprised to hear that, but then it also makes perfect sense. Mm -hmm. If your body's blood sugar levels are feeling chaotic and your body is interpreting that there's, there's feast and there's mm -hmm. famine and there's this stress, stress um, it kind of sends your body into a, into a frenzy. Mm -hmm. And so those feelings of, you know, anxiety, stress, getting back to the irritability and stuff like that are so strongly kind of linked to that one simple piece of blood sugar. It is, and, and it's especially prevalent for women, particularly women over 40 who've started the decline in estrogen and progesterone, moving towards menopause, and they're like, why am I suddenly gaining belly fat? Like, I've never gained weight in my middle before. I've always put it on in my hips and thighs, but, like, I have belly fat now. What's that about? And it's like, that's about blood sugar. Wow. And that's about your body doing the feast and famine. It's about your body wanting to protect you because your peaks and valleys are so extreme mm -hmm. and your cortisol, your stress hormone is spiking so often that your body is trying to create extra energy, the fat, and mm -hmm. store it right where it can be used near your liver. But it's doing that at such a rate that it can never burn through right. that much excess energy. And so it's really a huge component of that, like, really typical midlife weight gain is blood sugar instability. Wow. So what would be some of the, the simple switches or healthy habits for people to start um, getting their blood sugar better regulated? Um, there are two that I like, two, two suggestions I like to make for people. And the first is... When you're eating, go back to that idea of what's a protein and what's a carbohydrate and make sure that you're eating a protein and a carb at the same time. Even if it's your 2 o'clock in the afternoon snack and you're trying not to have the coffee, well, maybe you have, a, you know, an apple, right? An apple sounds great, really healthy, lots of fiber, good vitamins, awesome. But an apple is carbs and has fructose and that's mm -hmm. going to affect your blood sugar. So in order to level out the blood sugar, put a smear of peanut butter on it or some other kind of nut butter, have a piece of cheese with it so that you're getting both the carbohydrate from the apple and the protein from the nut butter or the cheese. That's going to give you a longer burn energy mm -hmm. so that you're not, you know, having a big spike and then that fall off that, that can come later as the blood sugar dips. And then the second suggestion for stabilizing blood sugar, which I think it's huge because it's going to affect your sleep, which my personal opinion, sleep is the missing link in most people's wellness puzzle, but we don't like okay. to talk about that, <laughs> um, is if you are making a habit of having that nightly glass of wine sitting on the couch while you're watching Netflix right before you go to bed, or you're hanging out with Ben and Jerry and <laughs> having a little bit out of the carton right before bed. Either way, you know, whether it's um, alcohol sugar or whether it's, you know, sucrose sugar, those are going to affect your blood sugar in the same way. And that is you're getting the big spike of energy as you're consuming those. Mm -hmm. But when those blood sugar levels drop off, usually for many people right around that 3, 3.30 a.m. kind of big wake-up time, your body is being flooded with cortisol again, that stress hormone. Mm. And so that is what so many people say. I wake up in the middle of the night, and I'm, like, wide awake, and I can't go back to sleep. Mm -hmm. So we say, okay, well, dial it back. Are you having some big carb right before you go to bed and creating that blood sugar spike 
and then crash for mm-hmm. yourself. And if you are, maybe swap it out. Have a hard boiled egg right before you go to sleep. Have a cheese stick right before you go to sleep. Have some, you know, eat the peanut butter off the spoon. I don't care. Have some little hit of protein mm-hmm. right before you go to bed because that can help to stabilize the blood sugar, eliminate the drop that's causing the huge cortisol spike that's waking you up so that you can be ready to fight the bear or whatever your body thinks right. is happening in the middle of the night and mm-hmm. needs to protect you from. And it is it is so interesting, too, that like waking up in the middle of the night thing. Or if you wake up to use the restroom or something and then you go back to try and fall asleep and, yeah, your brain is just going crazy. Yeah, your, brain, your body's going, all right, it's time to wake up. It doesn't realize that it's mm-hmm. still time for sleep. Mm-hmm. Um, so would you say that a good recommendation, um, if you're eating a few hours before bedtime, kind of keeping your carbs lower or non ex- not, maybe not non-existent, no. but yeah, at yeah. least lower carbs, higher protein, higher protein. and fat. Yes. Um, and then I kind of try to have, like, if I am going to be eating carbohydrates, have them earlier in the day. Earlier in the day. So same thing with your glass of wine. Have your glass of wine as soon as you get home from work. Mm. Not at 10 o'clock when you're sitting on the couch. So your body at least has, has a couple hours. time to hours. metabolize it. Okay. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Have it with your meal rather than after your meal. So, okay. again, you're trying to get that carb-protein balance and not just, you know, dump the carb spike Mm -hmm. in by itself. Yeah. I know for me um, at night, if I find myself hungry, yeah, it's things like cheese or if we have turkey or something Mm -hmm. like that, then I go for the turkey. Um, Because, yeah, I definitely can notice if I – if I have something really sweet, then, yeah, it kind of, like, wakes you up. Mm -hmm. And then it it definitely is a noticeable – just like less restful sleep or I'm more likely to, you know, be tossing and turning and waking up throughout the night and things like that. Yeah. Um, And it seems, it seems counterintuitive to a lot of people though. And this is where, where people get stuck or sort of think, Oh, you know, I didn't really think about that because a lot of people use wine as a relaxation tool. Mm -hmm. Right. And you do get that initial, I, I don't drink, I'm actually allergic to alcohol, but (laughs) <laughs> I have other it's vices. Probably. Don't worry. Um, you know, the, the initial sort of, of warm, soothing rush and the alcohol itself does, you know, tend to mellow you out a little bit. Mm-hmm. And so people think, well, I'm having it before bed. Shouldn't it help me go to sleep? Well, yeah, it helps you go to sleep, but it does not help you in staying asleep. Right. And just alcohol in your bloodstream in general, like mm-hmm. even aside from the you know, if you're also having a really sugary alcoholic yeah. beverage, but just the alcohol in general, like impedes you from getting that deep sleep. Yes. Yeah. Wow. And yeah. I think so many people, um, you know, cause we know that alcohol is bad for us, quote unquote, but I think that it's, uh, like you said, it becomes kind of the coping mechanism after a really stressful day. Mm-hmm. So if we're not, doing our self-care and working for that balance and everything Mm -hmm. that we've kind of started the conversation with, then yeah, we get home at night and it's like, all right, now I need to have a drink. I need to do this. I deserve to go and splurge on, Mm -hmm. you know, whatever unhealthy thing we know Mm -hmm. we shouldn't have. Mm -hmm. But then it's so, it's so, um, such a negative spiral because then you've set yourself up for a horrible night's sleep, which means when you wake up the next morning, you're like starting from way, way behind the starting line Mm -hmm. and you know, it it just, it feeds on each other. So, you know, and that's why making one little change can have really positive knock on effects all throughout your day. Mm -hmm. Yeah. One of my, um, kind of, especially now it it actually just started getting cold here in Texas in the last couple days. Um, I still, I tend to be warm, which is why (laughs) not dressed for cold weather. Um, but whenever the weather's kind of starts shifting like this, I just kind of know I need to step up my, Mm -hmm. uh, my self care a little bit, so to speak. So one of the things I do is, you know, maybe can I, uh, one day a week or two days a week, switch out my coffee for matcha instead or green tea or um, yerba mate or something where maybe I'm just um, looking for something with a little less caffeine or whatever. And then at night, um, drinking hot tea Mm -hmm. and having something like chamomile tea or um, diffusing essential oils. I just really 
try to kind of step up my <laughs> my game, yeah. so to speak, because I know that um, my as my body's kind of trying to fight the uh, bacteria or flu or things that start going around, that it's even more important for me to be getting more sleep and doing more of those kind of um, just getting out of that cortisol state, yeah. you know, yeah. um, and especially in the summertime, I... Uh, I'm aware that I, I I tend to kind of spend a lot of time in that cortisol state. Mm-hmm. I'm always running around. I'm always like, I want to be outside yeah, and I want to fun. be doing all the things. Yeah. Um, and then I just kind of know that if I don't slow down in the mm-hmm. wintertime, my body will slow me down for right. me by getting right. sick. <laughs> yes. Yeah. And that's that's really interesting that you say that because I think that that's something that we've, we've lost in our culture is that idea, you know, and that that when you're sick, your body's sending you a message. Mm -hmm. And that the best thing that you can do is actually tune in and pay attention and rest and allow yourself to recover. And I know that's really hard because, you know, in corporate America, you may not get very much sick time. Right. Or you may feel the pressure that you have to do the work. You have to do the work. There's a deadline. I can't be sick. I don't have time to be sick. I can't afford to be sick. Whatever it is. But it's really kind of a radical act to call in sick. Mm -hmm. And so you know what? I'm not well right now. And the best thing I can do for my body is to rest. Right. And I think listening, I mean, the whole concept of listening to our body, I think, is... Um, you know, for the holistic health coaches, Mm -hmm. (laughs) you know, we have like a little bit clear understanding of that. But I know that, you know, when I first heard that term, you know, probably in yoga class or something, I was like, what? What? My body's not talking to me. You know, what do you mean? Listen. Um, But that's a great example that like when you start noticing that, you know, you're sluggish, you're feeling sniffly or whatever, like now's not the time to push yourself yeah. to yeah. do more of all of the things, yeah. but to slow down. Right. And that's a great time to do a quick review of, okay, what am I doing? Where am I expected to be? What are my responsibilities? And what am I doing? Because I've always done it that I don't really need to do and mm-hmm. just drop it off. And like, you know, if you're, I, freely admit I hold myself to a very high standard regarding preparing meals for my family. Eating nutritiously is very important to me. Teaching my children how to cook is very important to me. Mm -hmm. And so I am a self-proclaimed, completely obsessive meal planner and home cook. That's wonderful. Right? Which which is great. (laughs) But I have to sometimes get over myself. Mm -hmm. And when things are really busy and when things are chaotic, I have to be okay with the fact that we're having tacos for dinner or that we're having soup and sandwich Mm -hmm. for dinner and that's okay so I my I now give myself you know I have to give myself permission to sort of tone it down right so I have a phrase that it's only Wednesday which means I don't have to like prepare Thanksgiving dinner every night of the week Mm -hmm. that during the week like let's eat real food but if it's a peanut butter sandwich and carrot sticks then it's a peanut butter sandwich and carrot sticks. And it doesn't happen very often, but when it does, that's okay. Right. And, you know, for women in particular, we tend to be perfectionists. We tend to be our own worst critics. Mm -hmm. um, And we tend to get in our own way a lot. And, you know, this is something that, you know, I do this for a living and I still have to work on it myself Mm -hmm. of being like, you know what? Do the best that you can with what you have at this moment. Right. And let go of the rest. And I think that that really touches on, um, you know, one of the biggest components of finding that balance and creating that balance, which is forgiving ourselves when we splurge on something bad or when we don't have time to do this thing or that thing. And I think that, you know, whether it's the piece of like, maybe like feeling guilt because we're taking time for ourselves or feeling shame because we didn't do the thing we wanted to do or whatever, like letting go of those feelings of, you know, shame or guilt being hard on ourselves is so challenging. It is. It's so challenging, but I think that it really um, is kind of at the cornerstone of finding that perfect balance Mm -hmm. because at the end of the day, we are real people. Right. And we have really busy lifestyles. Yeah. And some days it's like, 
you know, when it rains, it pours. Mm -hmm. All of the things are today. Right. All of the bills are due today. All of the things. I have 25 meetings today. And then, like, maybe that's the day where you just forgive and let go of that guilt or shame or self-judgment because you have to do something quick or you, you know, eat something that normally you wouldn't want to do, whatever. Um, But I think being able to to recognize, um, you know, when we're doing our best and then giving ourselves a break in just putting it all in the context of, you know, we're real people, we live real lives, and those lives are super stressful. Yeah. Um, and realizing it's, it's not failure, that it's just sort of part of the bigger picture. Mm-hmm. And that, you know, well, just because I didn't do it the way that I wanted to today doesn't mean that I should stop making an effort. Right. And you know what? Maybe that is really the, um, you know, the, the goal there is that you don't, Um, you don't give up. You Mm -hmm. know, I always hear people say, oh, and then I fall off the horse and I just can't get back on. And I'm like, well, why not? Is the horse standing on you? Did it step (laughs) on your foot? Like, are you physically incapable? Yeah. Yeah. Um, And it's like, no, well, I just, you know, because we'll feel so bad about ourselves when we do something that we, quote unquote, shouldn't do or whatever. Um, And then it feels like, oh, well, I I, I messed up this week. I'll start again next week or whatever. Um, So that kind of constant you know, peace that, you know, uh, wherever you're at, whatever happened, like you just look forward. Right. And you don't, um, you know, hold your attention in the past quote unquote mistakes. Right. right. Or oh, whatever. I love to tell people all the time, like, I love mistakes because it means that I'm trying, but as long as I'm making new mistakes, <laughs> then things are moving in the right direction. I love that. And, you know, don't ever be afraid to make mistakes. Just make new ones all the time. Mm-hmm. So you're constantly learning and it's Absolutely. always a progression. It's feedback. I also think for myself, um, like there's that little saying, it's not what you do some of the time, it's what you do most of the time. Mm-hmm. So if most of the time you're really doing your best and you're doing well, then those occasional, you know, birthday parties right. or special occasions, holidays, right. whatever. And they should be fun. Mm-hmm. That's what makes life. Right. And those things don't take away from all of the good stuff that you Mm -hmm. did. Like sometimes people will say, oh, well, I did have a salad, but then I canceled it out by eating a cupcake. And I'm like, well, you didn't cancel it out. Yeah. Like you still got all of the benefits of the good things you did. Yeah. And, you know, while, um, you know, maybe there's some negative effects of splurging on the glass of wine or the piece of cake or whatever, it doesn't negate all of the good that you've done. And you have to still be proud of all of the good things you've done and not let that be, um, you know, darkened because of this one thing or one time that you um, didn't have time to prep your meals so you got fast food or something like that. Yeah, no, it's move forward and moving forward in the small ways adds up. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I feel, I feel for people who are at the beginning of this journey because it does seem so overwhelming Mm -hmm. and it does seem like, you know, I'm asking you to like stand on your head, you know, and you've never even contemplated standing on your head before. (laughs) Um, but the reality is that that the small changes add up, they make a difference. It, It is, um, all little marginal changes that little by little are, you know, rewiring your body, mm-hmm. that are improving your mood, that are giving you more energy. And, you know, that's what it's about. Mm-hmm. And that, you know, it goes back to the idea of trying to, to crowd out negative habits by creating positive habits rather than just saying, you know, don't ever do this again, never do this. Because that's just not reality for most people. Right. There are a never few people say... who can flip the switch and make it happen, but I'm not one of them. Mm-hmm. Yeah, never say never, as they mm. say. You know, and I find that for myself too. You know, if I give myself, um, you know, a big goal that I feel really overwhelmed by, then like I'm really not likely to even really start on it because yeah. I've already decided that I can't, can't do, do it, it or it's yeah. too hard or it's too big. So if I can just kind of shift my thinking to be like, oh, this one little thing, right. drinking a glass of water every morning, yeah. which is something I'm already doing and I love it. And I yeah. just, um, you know, it's, uh, but it but it was a habit that I had to, you know, start integrating. And now I always go to bed with, I usually have my big water bottle and a big glass of water too, mm-hmm. so that I, when I wake up in the morning, I have plenty of water to choose from. Um, And you're so right. If we just 
uh, you know, make those like little tiny incremental changes, yeah. then suddenly, um, you know, maybe we're looking back at the last couple of months and it's like, man, I'm eating a salad every week. Right. I drink water every day. I've reduced my sugar or reduced my coffee or whatever. And you can really start to see how all of the little pieces really do add up. They do. To, um, to create a lot of change. Uh, before the, before we got started, we were kind of talking about how, you know, a lot of times it feels like if you want to have um, a big effect, that you have to have a big, big, big change. Yeah. Um, and really and truly, you can have huge effects from really, really small, simple changes. Um, like the little example of, you know, getting out of the car uh-huh. and, and doing little step ups on the curb for a couple minutes. But yeah. if you do that every time that you go you know, to the soccer game or whatever, then suddenly several days a week, yeah. several days a month, you know, you're really creating such a positive habit that it gets to the point you don't have to think about it. Yeah. You're not writing that into your schedule yeah. to do that. It just happens. Um, yeah. But at the same time, it is such a big change. And I think our bodies... Um, you know, as much as we really are kind of creatures of habit, we really love getting in the swing of things mm-hmm. and not deviating from the swing of things. Um, so uh, making it really simple and small of a transition, I think, is not only easier to uh, to set ourselves up for, but then I think it's also kind of easier on our bodies, too, mm-hmm. because if we're constantly... Uh, like you hear this a lot with um, yo-yo dieting exactly. and stuff. Like yeah. people will significantly change their diet. They lose a lot of weight. And then at some point they gain all the weight back. And then it's right. this constant thing. Right. Which Whereas, is really stressful on your heart, not mm-hmm. just the weight issue. Right. Um, you know, and so I always just kind of try to recommend to people, you know, it's going to be a lot more meaningful to your overall health and mm-hmm. your overall, you know, fitness or wellness goals to just make little tiny changes. Yeah, the Maybe. tiny changes are what's sustainable. And mm-hmm. that's that's the key that people who are looking to make a big change and they think that they have to do this big thing, mm-hmm. the big thing is really, really hard to sustain. Right. You might be able to talk yourself into doing it for 30 days, 60 days, 90 days, maybe even a year. But at some point, if you've missed all the steps along the way, it's it's nearly impossible to sustain. Mm-hmm. Um, so just kind of in, in closing here, one of the things you had mentioned uh, a little while back was that sleep is the missing piece mm-hmm. in a lot of people's health puzzles. I'm not exactly yep. quite sure how you phrased yep. it. Can you speak to that a little bit? And maybe yeah. some uh, simple switches or recommendations for people getting better sleep. Yeah. Well, you know, we live in a society with the prevailing attitude of I'll sleep when I'm dead, right? <laughs> I don't want to miss out on anything. You know, I'm so busy at work. I'm doing a million things over here. I'll just, I'll, whatever, I'll sleep when I'm dead. Because that's something that seems really easy to push off, right? Mm-hmm. That's something that we are actually really, really in control over. What time do I physically put my body in the bed? And then what time do I physically get my body out of the bed? Mm-hmm. But the part that we're missing is that if we carry that attitude, I'll sleep when I'm dead, it's going to happen a lot sooner than we think. Mm. Because so many things happen when we sleep, you know, things that most people think about, know about, which is, you know, our body gets rest, right? Physically, our body gets rest, our muscles repair, our brain is able to take a rest, super important for those of us who are in that high buzz Mm -hmm. a lot. Um, But what a lot of people don't realize is that sleep is absolutely critical for weight loss because we get our biggest metabolic boost of the day couple hours after we fall asleep so we want to be able to stay asleep and take advantage of that um sleep is critical for mood right that's pretty obvious to most people Mm -hmm. you know how are you today i didn't sleep very well you know (laughs) and then like if you have that mindset from the moment you wake up how does that affect the rest of your day Mm -hmm. physically mentally socially interpersonally um but sleep is also just so important for 
controlling the overall like regulatory systems of our body, our mm-hmm. hypothalamus, like your body's thermostat, really, really susceptible to changes in sleep. Um, so that's important, particularly for women in perimenopause who are hot flashing. You can get more sleep, the hypothalamus works better, suddenly hot flashing decreasing. Um, but ultimately, I think that it is the overall, again, back to that idea of human bandwidth, that overall acceptance that we are human, that we have only a certain amount to give, and that when we are well rested and taking time out of our day to actually get that rest, we can better utilize our other hours. Mm-hmm. And suddenly, you know, I almost think about it like when you recharge a battery. Absolutely. Like you wouldn't just put the battery in the charger for five minutes and then take it out. And expect it to be full. Yeah. And then yeah. put it in the thing and be like, well, what, what, why is the battery suddenly not working? You know, so why do we expect our bodies to be able to do that? Um, That's all, I think it's a larger <laughs> social messaging issue, but it, as if you couldn't tell, it's kind of one of my hot button issues. Mm-hmm. Um You know, I'm a firm believer in going to bed. Yeah. And I'm a firm believer in sleeping and, you know, and doing what I can to set up the systems of my life and the structure of my day so that I get my sleep. Yeah. You know, it's so funny. I remember being, you know, a little kid. Well, I don't super clearly remember being a little kid, but I remember, you know, feeling like, oh, I don't want to take a nap. Oh, I hate nap time, you know. Mm -hmm. And then it's so funny because now as an adult, I would do anything right, to have like, okay, here's this time set out for your day. And guess what? The only thing you can do is, is sleep. Yeah, I know. And what we're turning gift. off the light and we're leaving yeah. the room and you can't work and you can't get out your laptop and you can't do this. Yeah. And so it's so funny how that one little, uh, you know, nap time thing, it, you know, went from this like, oh nap yeah. time to now I'm like, oh, if only I, I had time. Please send me to bed. Well, um. <laughs> I, like I said, I'm, I'm wired differently than most people, just the way I was born. But my mom loves to tell the stories about when we would have babysitters over when I was young. You know, apparently the babysitters would negotiate, you know, well, if you're really good, I'll let you stay up extra late and let you watch whatever on TV. Mm-hmm. And that I would say back to the babysitters at like, you know, four or five, six years old, well, if I'm really good, can I go to bed right now? Like... <laughs> I've always just craved sleep, and I know that about myself, and I know that if I do not get quality sleep, I'm just worthless. Mm -hmm. Like, I am grouchy and unproductive, and it's just not a good scene. And so, hard and fast, I love sleep. I am so tickled by your little story. If I'm a good girl, can I go to bed now? Right now, (laughs) Because that's how I feel now. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. I get home, and I'm like, oh... If I make dinner, can I just go to bed right afterward? Yeah. <laughs> um, you know, and I think that getting, you know, back to that kind of overarching theme of balance that we started with, um, you know, I think a healthy uh, sleep, um, you know, schedule and and setting the time aside and then just making that decision, like you said, that I'm going to go to bed earlier. You yeah. know, I'm going to um, sleep in a little later. You know, I have a lot of people now that are like, oh, I saw that if you wake up at 4.30 in the morning, you're actually more productive and more energized. And I thought, well, yeah, but maybe if you go to bed at 9 yeah. p.m. Yeah, what time are you actually you starting know, that waking to, up Yeah, but if you're going to bed at 2 a.m., then please don't get up at no. 4.30, you know? And, and a lot of times when people get really um, kind of amped up about that weight loss thing, and it's like, oh, I'm going to get up three hours early so I can go to the gym. And at yeah. some point, you have to find the balance, yeah. which is you know, yes, it's good for you to work out. Yeah. But if it's at the cost of your sleep, right. then maybe you only get up an hour early right. and just do a workout at home. Right. Well, I tell people all the time, rest is probably the most critical component to any workout program. Mm. Because if we don't have rest, then we aren't ever giving our body time to synthesize all of the work that we're doing, like doing Shavasana at the end of a yoga practice, mm-hmm. you know, that is by design to allow your body on a really cellular level to just be like, oh, okay, I feel what you did there, mm-hmm. you know, and take it all in. Right. And then I think kind of on the, you know, flip side of that, um, having the healthy physical activity, at least for me, I find also kind of helps my sleep. Mm-hmm. And those times yep. when 
I, you know, am being, uh, you know, active on a regular basis and, and just, you know, basically keeping in mind that, you know, I want to try to find those times throughout the day that I can be active mm -hmm. and just the mindfulness that I want to be more active than sedentary, mm -hmm. which I think is kind of similar to what Absolutely. you were saying about yeah. like finding those, in. yeah, finding those little minutes of downtime that mm -hmm. you're going to just do something active rather than passive, you know, rather than sitting or laying or whatever. Mm -hmm. Um, that when I'm a bit more active, I will sleep better that night. Mm -hmm. And then on a general, uh, you know, piece, like those times when I get really good about, you know, doing my physical activities and, and uh, maybe I don't have a lot of meetings and stuff like that where I'm like, you know, sitting mm -hmm. for long periods of time, um, that I'll just feel more energized. Mm -hmm. And I think there's this great, yep. again, kind That's of balance, balance. Yep. <laughs> you know, of the physical exercise and the sleep that they really do feed each other. Mm -hmm. And then they also help each other. So if I exercise, it helps me sleep better. Mm -hmm. And then if I get more sleep, then it helps me have more energy to actually do a workout when right. I get done with my And work it helps day. your brain be more motivated to make better food choices because mm. you're not in starting off in crazy town. <laughs> starting off in crazy town. Yeah. That would be... I don't know. That just sounds like a good song title yeah, or something. I'll work on that. <laughs> you know, and I think that so many of us, you know, yeah, we just spend so much of our time mm -hmm. in that state. Yeah. And um, and that in and of itself feels so overwhelming. So yeah. um, I just want to thank you so much for being here on the program. My pleasure. Um, and sharing some little simple ways for us to hopefully get out of that little hamster wheel mm -hmm. um, and improve our health. Thanks for having me. Definitely. I definitely want to have you back on the program. Um, we had talked previously about doing um, a topic on metabolism and weight loss. And then you made a comment during uh, our discussion here uh, about being really into meal planning and mm -hmm. making healthy meals. So I don't know, maybe one of those or maybe a combination of those topics. Absolutely. <laughs> well, thank you so much for being here and we'll have you again soon. Thanks. I want to thank all of you for tuning into the podcast today. You can learn more about Karen by visiting runningonbalance.com. She's also available for personal training sessions and health coaching here in Austin. You can find the full one-hour video version of this podcast, as well as hundreds of other health and wellness videos over on wellnessplus.tv. I hope you will join us again soon for another edition of the podcast, and I hope you have a wonderful rest of your day.